Good evening and welcome to Southern Hills this evening. We do want to extend a special welcome to all of our guests and visitors tonight, as well as those, as well as those of you joining us via live stream. Welcome to Southern Hills again tonight. I hope everyone had a chance to pick up one of our bulletins uh, this morning or this evening, and if not, it's available online. Uh, feel free to look it up on our, on our website. Uh, but just a few announcements we'd like to make before we begin our services. Lois Pratt did have a bad reaction to her set second COVID-19 uh, vaccine and spent some time recently in Williamson Medical Center, but she is back at Morning Point in Spring Hill. Also, Doug Smithson sp spent some time in St. Thomas West for some breathing issues that he was experiencing, but he is back at home as well, and I know both of them would like to be remembered in our prayers. We also want to continue to extend our sympathy to Tyler and McKenna Atkins on the passing of Tyler's grandfather that happened happened very suddenly. I believe it was last Saturday. No arrangements have been made, but I know they would appreciate us remembering, remembering them in our prayers as they travel to and from Michigan. Also, we want to continue to extend our sympathy to, to Bobby and Wanda Ezell on the passing of their son-in-law, Michael Raines. Um, his funeral will be in Memphis uh, this Wednesday the 24th. Uh, we also want to congratulate Chuck and Jennifer Meek on the birth of Colton Branch Meek, uh, born February the 16th, um, weighing 7 pounds, 3 ounces, and was 19 and a half inches long. Uh, both of them, all of them are at home, and I do believe they've, all, they've been able to go to Cracker Barrel and enjoy a meal together as a family, so they're all doing very well um, after that birth. Uh, but those are the, oh, one other thing is March the 12th um, is Breakfast with Dan. It was pointed out to me that it's in the bulletin is March the 5th, but it's actually March the 12th. Uh, Breakfast with Dan will be here at the building. Um, if you're interested and able to go to that, I encourage you to sign up for it so we make sure that we have uh, plenty of food for everyone. But those are the announcements that I have uh, for this evening. If you would, bow with me in prayer as we begin. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day that we have enjoyed in gathering together to worship your name and gather around your throne. Father, we pray that as we worship tonight, you, you be with each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening. Our first song tonight will be number 822. 822, Heaven Came Down. I will sing the first and last verse of this song. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend, he met.
song before our opening scripture and prayer will be number 118. 118. I will sing the first and last verse of this song. When upon my pillow you are tempted Scripture reading will be coming from Psalm 119, verses 25 through 27. Again, that is Psalm 119, 25 through 27. My soul clings to the dust. Give me life according to your word. When I told of my ways, you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts, and I will meditate on your, your wondrous works. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for this beautiful day and for waking up to a beautiful time to recognize the first day of the week as an opportunity to take advantage of a command that you've given to us to worship you. Our prayer, Father, is that we have done so in spirit and in truth as we continue our time together as your children. We pray that the songs that we sing are from our heart. We pray that the study that we do tonight will be in a way that will help us to be better students of your word. Father, you are an awesome God, and we are so thankful to be called your children. There have been those who have been mentioned tonight, Father, who are dealing with sicknesses and struggles. Our prayer is that you will help them, whether they be at home, recovering, whether they be in the hospital, receiving treatment, whether they be suffering silently with personal and private issues. Father, there are those who will be undergoing some medical tests this week. Our prayer is that you will help those tests to be successful. Father, our prayer is that with this pandemic continuing, that you will bring an end to it soon. Be with those who are recovering from that. Be with those who are anxious, who have not had it, and have those fears about what it may bring. Give us strength, Father, to keep our faith strong, that no matter what happens, whether it be a virus, whether it be things going on with our government, whether it be things going on in our personal lives, that you, you will keep our focus on things that are eternal and not things that are earthly. I pray for the lost. I pray that you will 
help hearts to be softened, for minds to be opened, to ears to hear your word so that they can learn the truth. Give us the strength, give us the courage, give us the zeal to reach out to a lost world to tell them of your good news. Fathers, we think about our time here on earth. We know that it is just a short span. And we pray, Father, that you will help us to live our lives each day in a way that prepares us for eternity. You know our shortcomings, our weaknesses, and our failures. And we ask humbly for your forgiveness. We're most grateful for your son Jesus, for his willingness to die on Calvary's cross. Help us to never forget that great sacrifice. We're so thankful for your love for us, his love for us, that he gave his life for us. And it's his name that we pray. Amen. Our invitation song will be number 61. 61. Are you coming to Jesus tonight? For that, we'll sing number one. Number one, a beautiful life. Each day I'll do. Each day I'll do.
You can go ahead and start opening your Bibles up to Hebrews chapter 10. That's the first passage we're going to look at tonight. Um, this is a question box or a question and answer lesson. Uh, we've done these, I think this is now our fourth one. It, the plan is to do them every third Sunday. I would encourage you, as always, to, if you have questions, to submit them. Again, you can send an email to uh, Garrett at southernhills.net. You could put a question in the box in the back. Some have just sent me a text message. Some have just asked me questions. And, and so any way you can get a question to me, I'll receive it and, and do the best that I can to answer them. I think we'll find even in lesson of the day that there are some questions that I'll just admit I don't know the answer to, uh, but, but I'll give you the, the, the best that I can with it. Um, and so we got three questions that I hope to get to tonight. The first one is this. Dramatic pause. There we go. There we go. Okay. Can it be shown from the New Testament that we are required to assemble only on the first day of the week to worship God? Uh, if not, what is the purpose of our assembly? Really good question. I, I think lots of people have questions along these lines, and, and I get asked questions along these lines fairly often. A couple things I think are important to note that, that I think sometimes we— I might say misunderstand. And the first one is this. There we go. I think we often confuse worship and assembly. We almost use them like they're synonymous words. You know, that, that when we talk about the assembly, we're talking about worship. When we're talking about worship, we're talking about the assembly. And I, I don't deny, as a matter of fact, I know it to be true that worship is something we do while assembled together, but we need to appreciate the fact that the words don't mean the same thing. They're not synonymous terms, okay? So when the Bible talks about the assembly and the Bible talks about worship, it's talking about two separate things. They might take place, at least to some degree, at the same time. But it is not necessarily exactly the same, right? Uh, the idea of worship is, and, and if you're to look it up in, in a dictionary, like dictionaries define it a little bit different. Sometimes it'll say something like to prostrate yourself towards, uh, like to, to bow down before or something. Uh, some translations or, I'm sorry, um, dictionaries will say something along the lines of, it's like to kiss towards, Right, but the idea of worship is basically a show of love, of thanksgiving, of appreciation uh, towards God. And, and we do that in a number of different ways. All right, we could do that through song, where we sing and, and really magnify the name of God and lift him up and express to him love and appreciation and thanksgiving. We could do it in prayer, right? We could do it through the reading of scripture. There's different ways of doing that. But, but worship is that. Worship is, is a show of love and thanksgiving and appreciation towards God. The assembly is, is, is simply like when the saints assembled together. Now, what we know is that the New Testament teaches and, and indicates that there is a specific day in which the saints were to assemble together. And while they were assembled together, they, they worshiped, but that's not the only thing they did. They did other things together. It's like when we come together on Sunday morning, for example, we worship, but that's not the only thing we do. We also give announcements, right? And, and, and what we're doing throughout the announcements, at least the idea of it, is to, to inform each other about what's going on with the saints, right? And what's going on in our lives and in our family. Is somebody sick? Like, let, let's tell you about it. Does somebody need your prayers? Well, this is our time to share that. It's not worship, but it's what we do while we're assembled together. Uh, we have Bible classes on Sunday. Once again, not necessarily worship, but it's it's, it's something we do while assembled together. I would even make the argument that, that while we sing, there are some songs that are necessarily worshipful, some songs that are not. I think the New Testament in, even indicates that. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19, he talks about it. We actually read it this morning. Uh, it talks about our singing and describes three types of songs. 
psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. All right? Some of those are, are worshipful. Some songs we sing are like, Father, we love you. We worship and adore you. Magnify your name in all the earth. Like, that's worshipful. Some songs we sing are not necessarily worshipful. All right, some songs we sing are just more spiritual in nature. Um, I think about, you know, songs that we might teach our kids. Um, Give me the Bible. There's nothing about that song that is like worship, but it is a, a spiritual song. Uh, angry words. It's about a spiritual concept. It's about, it's about using our tongues right and using them appropriately. It's a spiritual concept, but not necessarily in and of itself worship. Right? And so we do a number of things when we're assembled together that, that are not worship. Now, we worship when we come together, but that's not all that we do. Okay? So understanding that, we're going to talk a little bit more about the purpose of our assembly. Okay, so when we talk about assembly, I think a really important passage to understand is Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, verse 25 is the verse that I think we, we run to and we know, but it, like all other passages, is, is a part of a context that if you want to understand it, you kind of have to understand what is being discussed. And what you need to know about the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews is a book primarily written to Christians who are, some of them, falling away from the Lord. And, and when that's happening, like as a family of God— that should concern us. I think probably if you were to ask me, like, what is the key verse to understanding the book of Hebrews? I would probably say Hebrews 3 and verse 12, where it says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. That seems to be, in a nutshell, what Hebrews is about. Don't be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Don't depart from the living God. And and in order to keep that from happening, we need to exhort one another. Interestingly, that passage says daily. It needs to be a part of our daily lives where we are encouraging and exhorting one another so that does not happen. Well, it's within this book where the Hebrew writer is trying to encourage Christians not to fall away that he says these words in Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. When you came to Christ, you made this confession— you spoke these words that, that, that your hope is all wrapped up and tied up within Jesus Christ. Like, hold on to that. Don't waver from that. What you need to know is that he's faithful. So like, if you remain faithful to him, you can always count on him being faithful to you. And so, like, my faithfulness at the end of the day is dependent upon me. But what's interesting is that he doesn't stop there. He talks about like this this communal responsibility we have then. I need to make sure that I hold fast my confession, and you need to make sure that you hold fast your confession. But, But what can we do to help each other? Well, this is where he says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Like part of your life as a Christian is thinking and considering what what can I do to help stir my brethren up to, to love more, to love deeper, to having better works. Like, like, what can we do to help each other? You should think that way with me, and I should think that way with you. Like, like, what can I do to help you in your walk with God? What can you do to help me in my walk with God? What can we do to help each other in our walk with God? Like, at the end of the day, one of the most important concepts of the New Testament is understanding we are a family. 
the family of God. And I want you to be faithful to your God. And you want me to be faithful to my God. And so I need to consider and think about and contemplate and mold over like, what can I do to help my brethren in that? How can I help them? How can I stir up love and good works within them? Because what a lot of people do is they try to live out their Christian lives kind of on an island or by themselves. Well, I, you know, I can, I can, I can just be faithful. And, and the idea is that, no, you, the church is a family. And, 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 and we're involved in each other's lives and we're helping each other in, in each other's lives. And, and like, you're thinking about how you can help me and I'm thinking about how I could help you. And like, we're all thinking about like, how can we stir up one another to love and good works? And it's within that context that he says this, not neglecting to meet together. Some of your translations will say not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Like th- this is just universally true. If I want to help you in your walk with God, I have to somehow be with you. Right? I mean, if, if, if I just say, well, I'm never with them, then, then I can't really help you. I can't, I can't possibly stir. And so, like, I, I think that's important, too, that, like, when we come here, we can say, well, we're, we're coming to worship partially. Yes, we worship. The truth is, you can worship at home. Right? I mean, I think COVID has taught us that like, we have the ability to worship at home. But he's not just saying worship. Assemble. Meet together. Like, you can't do that at home. Right? And so that's really important that we, we grab onto that. Like, what, what, what we're not supposed to forsake, what, what we're supposed to not neglect is meeting together. Why? So that we can encourage each other. So that we can stir one another up to love and to good works. Now, here's the interesting thing, because some people are probably running to this, this idea that, well, then is it wrong to do what we did during, like, this virus that's going on? And I'll point you to what he says next. As the habit of some is. He's not saying that there's never any reason under the sun that you can miss the assembly. What he's saying is that some people make a habit of missing it. They, the reason people make a habit of missing it is because they're not thinking about stirring each other up to love and good works. Now, like, if, if there's, like, a global, like, virus that's going around, and, like, for a week or two, we say, you know what, we're, gonna, we're, we're going to uh, do our worship maybe a little bit different. Like, that's not what he's talking about here. If we say, okay, when we assemble together for a little while, we're going to do things a little bit different. We're going to ask if we can maybe sit a little further apart. We're going to put some, 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 some space between the pews. Like, that's, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about people who make a habit of just not meeting with the church. And he says, no, like, how could you stir one another up to love and good works then? Like if, you, if you want to stir each other up, you have to be together. And some people have made the habit of just not. And, and so he goes on, but, right, instead of that, but encourage one another, or encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I think Christians should live every moment, every moment. they should live with the, the constant realization. Well, obviously, we're not going to think about like every second of the day, but like, like we're, we, we live with the constant realization that we're drawing nearer and nearer to that great day when we stand before our God. And, and as that day draws nearer and nearer and nearer, don't know when that's going to happen, But every moment I live, the closer it becomes. 
I ought to become more and more concerned with making sure I hold fast the confession of my hope without wavering. And I need to make sure that I'm stirring you up and you're stirring me up to love and good works because we all want to be ready when that day comes. And so the question, like, what's the purpose of our assembly? Well, the purpose of the assembly is to stir up one another for love and good works. To encourage each other. Worship is about expressing love and appreciation and a gratitude towards God. But we could do that in a number of different places. Paul did that from a prison cell in Philippians chapter 16. I'm sorry, Acts 16, when he was in Philippi. But like, we assemble to stir one another up to love and good works. We assemble, we come together to encourage one another in, in our walk with God. And so, you, like, technically, if you're, if you're looking at this passage— the, the meet together, some of your translations say, not forsaking the assembly. So he has in mind here, the assembly. It has a definite article, which means there's a definite assembly he's talking about. He's talking about specifically the assembly of the saints on Sunday. But I would argue, if you're thinking about how to stir one another up to love and good works. Wouldn't it be a great opportunity, if possible, to do that on Wednesday also? Wouldn't it be a good opportunity to do that, like, like throughout the week even? I think I mentioned earlier from chapter 3. He says, uh, beware, brethren, lest not not be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily, as you see the day approach. Like, this idea that, like, you should live your life considering your family and, and, and how to stir them up and encourage them. So I hope that's helpful uh, in, in understanding our assembly and the purpose of our assembly and why we come together. Do we worship? Yes, that is part of it. But the other part is more communal than that. The other part is we need to be together to stir each other up to love and to good works. We need to be together to encourage each other. And that's what we're not supposed to neglect meeting together for. Okay, uh, so I hope that answers it to some degree. Uh, the next question, and this is, I, I mentioned it earlier. There, some of these I don't know the answer to, and, and, and this is one of them. Uh, it says, why did Luke use the genealogy of Joseph if Jesus was not his biological son? Okay, so when you're reading throughout the gospel accounts, several of the gospel accounts give these long genealogies, and they're not exactly the same, but they're, they're similar, and, and there's reasons why they give these genealogies. And I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, I haven't spent a lot of my life really dissecting the genealogies that are found throughout the Bible. You know, I I read through them. I I try to understand why they are there and and, and the purpose of them. But there there are things, and and, as as I was researching this question, I found that, you know, really a lot of people have a lot of different beliefs about this. And so I don't think I'm going to figure it out in like the hour that I'm giving to this question to study it out and try to figure it out. Right. And so let me tell you what, what, what I'm thinking. First of all is this, I think we need to understand it's not a foregone conclusion that he did. When, when you read the, the, the passage, it seems like he's going to be tracing Joseph's line. But there's some things I think we need to take into consideration because I'm kind of thinking he didn't trace Joseph's line. And, and I'll explain that to you here in just a moment. Uh, the purpose of the genealogy is to prove what he said in Luke 1, 31 and 30 through 33. Okay, so I, I, what I say is like, what, what I try to focus on typically when, when I'm studying through the New Testament is why is this being said? Why is... He, he giving this genealogy here. And I think the reason for it is because he said something back in Luke 1, 31 through 33, that he's trying to validate. 
He's trying to prove. Ultimately, what he's trying to do is, is prove that Christ is who he says he is. Okay, so in Luke 1, 31 through 33, it says, And behold, and this is obviously being spoken to Mary, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called, get this, the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. So if you're reading through this section, what you'll notice is that Luke, as he writes this, says that Jesus, in a sense, had two fathers, right? The son of the Most High. That's what he's going to be called. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. Like that's a really big, important thing to say. He's going to spend a lot of time trying to prove and validate that claim because that's a big claim to be called the son of the most high. But he also says he will give to him the throne of his father, David. And so there's a sense in which he came through David also. And, and that's ultimately why he's going to give this genealogy, is he's trying to validate his line, trying to validate his lineage, okay? So Luke 3, 21 through 22, which comes right before the genealogy, proves that he's the son of the Most High. Okay, so there's, there's the account of Jesus' baptism, and Jesus' baptism, the Spirit descends like a dove, and this great voice thunders from heaven, <laughs> this is my son, or my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. All right, if you want evidence that Jesus is the Son of God, that's about as good of evidence as you're going to get. The voice of God speaking from heaven saying, this is my Son. Okay, and so he, he, he's proving and he's validating who Jesus is and Jesus' lineage. Well, when we get to the genealogy part, Luke 3, 23 and following, what he's going to do is he's, he's essentially going to, in a way, prove both. Because as he goes through Jesus' genealogy, we'll get to that point where we see David. So he is a descendant of David. But what Luke does that's interesting is he takes it from there and he traces it all the way back to Adam. And then he says of Adam, the son of God. Right? So he's kind of following the lineage of God all the way down through Jesus. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. The point, the part we're going to focus on just for a minute is, is verse 23 and 24. And in verse 23 and 24, there's a couple of things I'm going to point out to you as we're reading it. First is, is we're going to see a man named Halai. And, and Halai, as is, is, is you read it, seems to be Joseph's father. Okay, what's interesting is that the Jewish Talmud says he was Mary's father. If you know what the Jewish Talmud is, it's basically what the Jews wrote down about their kind of oral histories. And so the Jews understood Halai to be the father of Mary. Now, obviously, if Scripture says one thing and the Jewish Talmud says the other, we're going to take Scripture. But I think also what we'll see is that it's possible the Scripture is not saying specifically that Halai is the father of Joseph. Okay? And, and I'm going to— some of this stuff gets really technical, and so I'm going to try to not get too technical with you. But a couple things you need to understand about translations, okay? One is that, um, like, uh, the parentheses, um, uh, the words escape in my mind, um, but um, no, the parentheses are not inspired. Okay, so punctuation. There we go. Uh, punctuation in Scripture is not inspired. All right, the, the, the punctuation of, uh, is you're reading through, like, English and Greek have different punctuation. And so we have parentheses in this passage, and, and I'm going to suggest to you that maybe the parentheses are in the wrong part, but uh, it's, it's, it's just because, like, that's, that's just man put that in there where they thought it belonged. The second part is that words often are added into your English Bibles for clarity. Okay, it's hard to—you can't make a perfect—anyone who's ever studied a language knows that you, it's, it's, it's impossible to take one language and perfectly put it into another language. 
And so when you're translating, you always have to kind of finagle it and smooth things out. And sometimes words are added for clarity and for, for ease of reading. Oftentimes when you're reading your Bibles, those words will be in italics. And so the translators are letting you know, we put these in here. New King James does that uh, very often. Like, w- we added these words. We want you to know we added these words. We think it just reads better. Okay, so what we're going to have in this passage is both parentheses that some think are in the wrong place and words that are added that some think shouldn't have been added. Okay, Um, and and that's just because translations can be tricky like that. Okay, so what the passage says and how it reads is Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son, as was supposed, of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of uh, Mephat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of uh, Janai, the son of Joseph. Okay, so we're going to focus on verse 23. I put those parts in red. What, what Luke is wanting you to understand is that people supposed that Joseph was his father. But what Luke has already said is that Joseph was not his father. He's the son of the Most High. And so he is to be called the son of the Most High. Some people still said he was the son of Joseph, but that's not right. That's not correct. He is not the son of Joseph. He is the son of the Most High. Okay? And then you have this part right here, the son of Heli. And so when you read this, what is being said, or seems like is being said, is that Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son, as was supposed of Joseph, the son of Heli. So it seems like Joseph was the son of Heli. What I'm going to talk about is these things right here, the parentheses and the son. Again, the son was added. It doesn't belong in the original text. The parentheses uh, are, again, it's it's English translators uh, putting what seems to be kind of a a phrase that uh, needs to have that. uh, But some think that that they're in the wrong place, okay? So what I'm going to show you is, is how many people think the text should be read. And that is this. Jesus, when he began his ministry was about 30 years of age, being the son, as was supposed of Joseph, of Heli, the son of Mephat, the son of Levi, the son of... And so what that does is that reads a little bit different now. It seems like Jesus is being called the son of Heli. And you say, well, how is Jesus the son of Heli? Well, basically the idea is that if you have a man born who has no earthly father, who is his closest blood father figure? His grandfather, by blood, Mary's father. And so Jesus is being called the son of Eli because that's his closest relative blood father figure, okay? When technically he didn't have an earthly father. And so that's a long explanation. I hope it makes it clear. It doesn't make it too confusing. I know it's pretty technical, but to answer the question, why did Luke use the genealogy of Joseph if Jesus was not his biological son? Uh, To answer the question, I don't know that he did. Uh, I I kind of think that he he went through Mary, Uh, but there are people who study this a whole lot more than I have who think the other way. And so Um, that's at least the best I can do for an answer to that question. The last question I think I can answer a little more clearly, and that is what is the unforgivable sin? Okay, a couple things we're going to look at when we're talking about this question. First, we need to read what the passage says, because I think that will give us some clarity about what it is. But then secondly, what we're going to see is what Jesus went on to say after this discussion of the unforgivable sin. And if one thing you'll understand is that I believe that when there are difficult passages, studying around them will often clarify those difficult passages. Okay? Um, And so as we look at what the passage says, it comes from Matthew chapter 12, uh, verses 22 through 32, and, and we'll go ahead and read through this. It says, Then a demon oppressed man who was blind and mute, was brought to him, and he healed him. 
So the man spoke and saw, and all the people were amazed and said, can this be the son of David? Okay, so what I want you to notice right now is that when they saw Jesus do what Jesus did, they were confused about who Jesus was. And that's often going to be the case. And, and I would suggest that that's, that's natural. It, it's kind of the natural course of things. That people, when they're first presented with this message of Jesus, had to make a decision. But not all of them just jumped right on board and said, he's the Christ, the Son of God. They're trying to figure it out. And some people would say things that were incorrect. Some people would say things that are right, but aren't exactly enough. And so people were trying to figure out. And so technically what would happen is sometimes people would say things about Jesus that was, was not correct. We might even call it blasphemy. He's not, he's not, the, he's not the son of God, is he? Uh, no, he, he can't be that. It's not like a, a, an evil hearted person. It's somebody trying to figure something out. But what we'll see next is people who weren't trying to figure it out. They were doing anything within their power to deny. And so he says next in verse 24, but when the Pharisees heard it, they said, it is only by Beelzebul, the ruler, or sorry, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. Like, and, and what Jesus will point out is it's a really illogical thought that they have. They, they have, in, in a sense, what, what they have is they have Satan fighting against Satan. And he'll even point out, like, like the Pharisees had people who at least claimed, and, and there's really no specifics given about whether they did it or not, they, they claimed to cast out demons. And so what they have is people casting out demons they say is the work of God. And then they look at Jesus, and he casts out demons, and they say it's the power of Beelzebul. And it's kind of like they're doing the same thing. One of them you say is of God, and the other you're saying is, is you know, a work of Beelzebul, like the ruler or the prince of demons. Like, they, they weren't being logical. They weren't being reasonable. They were just doing anything and saying anything they could possibly say to neglect Jesus. So, verse 25 says, and I think this is very important, knowing their thoughts. See, anyone around could have just heard the sayings, but Jesus had the ability to know what's going on inside of the person saying it. And ultimately, I'm going to suggest to you, that's more the problem. He knew what was inside them. It wasn't just about the thing said. It was about the heart of the one saying it. But knowing their thoughts, he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, Satan... He is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by, by, Beelzebul how, or by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds a strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore, I tell you. The word therefore, like what he's about to say is, is because of what he's been saying. Therefore, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven. But the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Notice, it's not that it can't be forgiven. It won't be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Again, not that they can't be, but they will not be. Why will they not be? And, and, and notice this part also. He says, either in this age... Or the age to come. So sometimes what we do, and I think we make a mistake of it, 
is we say they did something we can't do. If you look at technically what they did, they saw Jesus cast out a demon. They said it was by the power of Beelzebul. And now you say, okay, yeah, I can't do that. I'm not going to see Jesus walking around. I'm not going to see him casting out demons. I'm not going to be able to blaspheme the Holy Spirit in that way. But I think if you pay attention, what Jesus is saying here is not only something that could have been done while he walked this earth. So what was it? Keep reading. Either make a tree good and its fruit good, or make a tree bad and its fruit bad. The tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? Why won't they be forgiven? Because they're just evil. Why did they say what they said? Because they're evil hearted people. He says, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Why would they say what they said. I mean, some people saw the thing Jesus did and they were like, is this the son of David? I don't know. And they're trying to figure, these people looked and they said, no, it's by the power of Beelzebub. How did they know? Their, their people did the same thing and they said it was from God, but Jesus did it. And they said, oh, it's by the power of Beelzebub. How did they know? They didn't. As a matter of fact, I would suggest maybe, maybe they did know it, but they were so evil in their hearts that their mouth just spoke. It doesn't matter what they saw. Their heart was so set against the Lord. It was so bitter towards him. It was so adamantly opposed to everything about him that they just spoke. Verse 35, the good person out of the good treasure brings forth good. And the evil person out of the evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. Why won't they be forgiven? Because they're given an account. Because they spoke evil, evil things, and they spoke evil, evil things because their heart was evil. And it was hard, and it was ugly, and it was set against Jesus, and no matter what he did, they were going to reject it. He says, for by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. Why do their words condemn them? Why won't their words be forgiven? Because they came from an ugly heart, an evil one. Now, I think we need to understand people can still be that way. They might not say the exact thing that Jesus said, or that, I'm sorry, that they said, the Pharisee said. But there will be people who set themselves against God and will never, ever change. I mean, when you think about these people, it's quite amazing. Like they deny Jesus, they deny Jesus, they deny Jesus to the point where they actually crucified him. And then, amazingly, Jesus lived again. And you would think, and for some people, for some people, they saw that and it changed their whole outlook on the man. And they said, we've been wrong and we're going to, like, it was, it's it's like the, the thing that kind of shook the world, right? Both literally and physically, like, like it, it shook the world. And like Christianity was like this amazing thing because Jesus was killed, but now he's alive again. But you know what they did? They imprisoned and beat and killed his apostles who talked about it. Why? Evil heart. (laughs) How can you forgive that? 
you, you can't penetrate it. You can't get, there will be people who speak against Jesus, but guess what? Like, they're just trying to figure it out. But someone who would see that and do what they did, it, it shows their heart. And so there's a sense in which I would agree, yeah, we can't do exactly what they did. But I think we would be missing something if, if we say that in another sense, we can't do what they did. Like every one of us needs to make sure that we don't do what they did. Actually, we talked about it at the very beginning of this lesson. Hebrews 3 and verse 12. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. We can still harden our hearts against God. We can still speak foul and perverse things because of the hardness of our hearts. That's what they did. That's what they stood before God having done. That's what they will face their judgment because of. And and we need to make sure that we don't do the same. And so, no, can we do exactly what they did? Not exactly. But we can, in a sense, do what they did. We can harden ourselves to where God's word will never penetrate it. Um, and, and so, what is the unforgivable sin? Well, what they did was they saw Jesus cast a demon out. And, and they, they didn't accredit the good deed to God. They accredited the good deed to the ruler of the demons. But more than that, what they did was they hardened themselves against Jesus. And so that is what I believe the unforgivable sin is. Hardening yourself against God, against good, against what is right, against our Lord, against his spirit, and, and hardening ourselves to the point where we speak what they spoke and, and, and we just can't be penetrated. And so that is, is my understanding of the unforgivable sin. Again, uh, we plan on doing another one of these lessons and next month on the third Sunday. Um, and so if you have questions, please put them in the box. I'll do my best to answer them in the best way that I know how. Uh, if there's anyone in here tonight who's not yet a Christian, we would love to help you in any way we can. If we can study with you, pray for you. If there's anyone in here tonight who needs to be baptized, we would love to baptize you. If there's something we can do uh, to help you in your relationship with God, we give you this opportunity to sit on one of the front rows while we stand and sing this invitation song. The voice of the Savior.
Ziel. Uh, we have set aside this time for anybody who is unable to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning. Um, we have little cups in the back. Uh, if you did not get one, uh, if you would raise your hand, uh, Andy in the back would be happy to bring one up to you. Uh, we're so thankful for this day that we've been able to worship and assemble and encourage. And I pray that during this time that we can focus on uh, the forgiveness that we have through Jesus and this sacrifice that he made on the cross. Will you pray with me as uh, we pray for the bread? Lord, we love you. And we're so thankful for your son, Jesus. We're thankful that uh, his death has uh, given us hope of salvation and hope to overcome our sin. And I pray that uh, if there's ever times that we struggle with sin and, and uh, the depths of it and being clung and trapped in it, Lord, that we see that there is great hope and forgiveness. And it's because of your son, Jesus, and him dying on the cross for us. As we remember the body he sacrificed, I pray that we remember that uh, through our life that we must make many sacrifices to, to live like your son, Christ, and that uh, we can be more and more like him. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you pray for the cup with me? Lord, uh, you are an amazing God. And we are in awe of your plan for us, Lord, and your grace that you gave us and the sacrifice of sending your son. We're so thankful for Christ than his pure, precious blood that washes us clean and cleanses us of our sins, Lord. I pray that uh, as those who partake today and those that are here with them, that uh, we can focus on how grateful and thankful we are for that cleansing blood. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Uh, the elders have now set this time aside uh, for any who un were unable to give this morning. Um, uh, on the screen up, you'll see a QR code, uh, a text option, and we also have a box in the back uh, that you can uh, drop your uh, giving and donation. Uh, will you pray with me, please? Lord, we are so blessed. And Lord, I pray that um, as these funds are given for your work, Lord, and for the work around the world and in this area, that uh, we put more faith and trust in you and in your church, Lord. And that uh, the things that we have been given, we give back. And we give back generously to those who need it. We're thankful for this church and, and the work that uh, it's doing. I pray that we can be the hands and feet of, of you and that we can use these funds to bring souls to you. And it's in your son's name we pray, amen.
Thank you, Garrett, for that great lesson. We'd like to welcome each and every one of you here to Southern Hills tonight. We're so glad that you were able to make it out here to join us with, and worship with us. We'd like to invite you back here to our midweek Bible study at 7 p.m. If you would, please stand for our closing song. We'll sing number 213. 213. He, he gave me a song. We lean the first and last verse of this song. He took my burdens all away. Please bow as we go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this night we have to come together to worship and learn more about you. Thank you for the roof over our heads and the cars we had to drive here. Thank you for the road conditions allowing us all to get here. Thank you for Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, that we have a path to heaven and a way to be forgiven of our sins. Please help all of us with COVID and um, especially those who lost loved ones to it. Please help everyone that um, couldn't make it here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.